edition of Two Guys and a Chainsaw. I'm Todd. I'm Craig. And uh, today we're starting off with the third of our Wes Craven films. Well, we started out with... Uh, the People Under the Stairs. Yep, and then we went to Nightmare on Elm Street, the original. The original. And today we've decided to try something that's probably a little less well-known of his oeuvre. Maybe for good reason. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Deadly Friend. You know, I came into this knowing that it was not critically claimed, uh -huh. but not wanting, hoping I wouldn't pile on it. I sort of have a feeling we might end up piling on it, though. I don't know. What, do you, what, did you, what are your initial thoughts after seeing it for the first time? Well, I was kind of excited coming into it, too. Um, I really, I don't know how I missed this in the first place. You know, I watch as many horror films as I can get my hand on. I'm a big fan of Craven's, and somehow this one just uh, slipped through the cracks for me. I'm a Christy Swanson fan from way back when, so I was excited to get a chance to see it. Now that we've seen it, uh, my feelings are a little bit mixed. Really? Yeah. How, how, what do you think? I tell you, um, well, yeah. I, I Now, knowing uh, a little bit of the backstory of the film, I know that this is not exactly the film that Craven had intended That's to right. do. He originally wanted to do something that would sort of prove that he's not a one-trick horror pony. Mm -hmm. uh, he did it. Uh, this movie was shown to test audiences. Um, apparently, according to him and the producer and the original writer, was a little more of a PG sort of film that was a little sweet, a little sad. Um, it's a Frankenstein movie. Right. And, you know, PG may be pushing PG-13, but uh, certainly not going for standard horror. And I think that when Test Audience saw what Craven originally did with it, they were let down just because of their expectations. You know, this came on the heels of the great success of Nightmare on Elm Street from 1984. This, this film came out in 1986. Uh, and I think it was just a matter of expectations. They weren't expecting a PG or a PG-13 teen sci-fi almost kind of after-school special kind of thing. Far more, you know, uh, I, I read that uh, he was shooting more for the tone of uh, films like Real Genius um, or uh, The Goonies, or he, he uh, referenced Starman as one of uh, his inspirations. Uh, you know, when I watched it, I was thinking a little bit of Explorers. Did you ever see yeah, Explorers? Yeah, yeah. Where the kid takes technology, this like super genius kid, goes on some kind, you know, creates something. Um, in Explorers' case, they create that ship, which they go and they, you know, with his friends and they travel and kind of have these little right. adventures. This was a little like that. You have your super genius kid. Yes, yeah, exactly. Well, I, maybe we should give a little bit of the story. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's a Frankenstein movie uh, overall, but we we open up with uh, this this kid Paul who is 15, I'm guessing, because he says later in the film that he's never learned to drive. Um, but he is a pretty uh, exceptional 15-year-old. He's apparently <laughs> a, a visiting professor uh, at Polytech, where he is lecturing on both uh, computer engineering and neuroscience, and working on computers and cadavers. I mean, this is a pretty impressive kid. And he comes with his own robot. Who's in the neighborhood with this sentient robot that he has put together and programmed himself, which everybody sort of treats like it's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's his little brother who maybe is a little bit off or something, I don't know. But, oh, you have um, this robot that, you know, just kind of thinks on its own and uh, <laughs> kind of wanders around aimlessly and you didn't really program it, it's learning and it's talking and stuff. Oh, okay, it can mow the lawn. Yeah, that's fine, yeah, totally, yeah. but you know, what's cool. more interesting is uh, the day-to-day -day life. <laughs> Right. Of a neuroscientist uh, child. Exactly. And, and you've got this robot, and of course at first the robot seems uh, relatively innocuous, you know, nothing to be afraid of. He's cute, he's short, you know, he's by today's standards the technology is almost laughable. Uh, I, I think at the time, you know, they were pretty impressed with what they had done with the, the technology for this robot. But by our standards, a little cutesy, a little uh, Johnny Five meets Wally. -E, yeah, bit. yeah, <clears throat> very um, um, short circuit in that way. Yeah. Yeah. So he moves into the neighborhood, and uh, we get some exposition where he meets first uh, this bumbling kid who's going to become kind of his uh, buddy in this little buddy adventure of sorts. Sure. And, and his um, name's Tom. Tom, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the girl next door, the very lovely Christy Swanson, 16 mm -hmm. years old. One of her first uh, roles, wasn't first, it? Uh, well, first full-length film, I believe. And then, of course, she went on to be pretty successful in the 80s and 90s with uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer is her big uh, breakthrough. But here she's very fresh-faced, very young, very pretty. You know, as a, as a young boy of the 80s, I remember Christy Swanson very fondly. Uh, <laughs> and, and she's kind of the maiden next door who is kind of tough and cool, but you can tell right from the beginning that uh, there's a little bit of a dark side uh, on the other side of the street. That's right. Um, there, she's basically right next door to him. Um, in the new house, and uh, the minute she meets him, pretty much, she can't stay long. 
because pretty soon her dad pokes his head out the door and looks at them and gives them that look. And you can tell just by looking at the dad, there are problems here. Oh, and the bruise on her arm. Yeah, Which is right. one of the first things that, um, that Paul, the kid, uh, sees. Exactly. So then the, the story is, is relatively tame for a while. You know, it's uh, this kid kind of getting used to his new environment. He's teaching classes at this university. He's, you know, kind of spending a little bit of time with uh, this new girl. Her name is Sam, Samantha. And then we start to see that there may be a little bit more to BB the robot. Uh, we haven't said his name yet, I don't think. Uh, there, there may be something a little bit uh, unpredictable uh, about BB. That's right. <clears throat> well, they first have a run in uh, with a. <clears throat> it's kind of like the neighborhood bully. <laughs> yes, uh, the, the, the neighborhood biker game. Well, the Danny Zuko of, uh, Zuko of, the, of the film, <laughs> Carl, right? Yeah, the, who, you know, the, who look like they're probably in their mid-30s, but uh, are, <laughs> are still high school bullies on this suburban avenue. That's <clears> right. <throat> They come up, and um, he, for just sort of, sort of no reason at all, just your typical neighborhood bully is harassing him. What the hell is this? Hey, come here. Look at this thing. Don't do that. Who's going to stop me? <laughs> hey, does anybody got a can opener? Oh, hey, don't get out of my face. Hey, careful, they'll hurt you. Who this garbage can? <laughs> Robot grabs him by the nuts and lifts him up in the air and has him call his guys off. And so, so know. it's established pretty on pretty early on that uh, BB can be a badass if BB needs to be. BB can defend himself, right? As long as you know you move relatively slowly, you're, right. you're kind of within BB's arms reach, you get up right. in his face, you know, yeah, you got a problem. Yeah, problem. problem. <laughs> so, so we're introduced to that. We're also introduced to uh, the old witch across the street. Um, Zelda. No, El is it it's Elvira, Zelda. wasn't Elvira, it? Elvira, yeah, you're Elvira, right. uh, both excellent names. <laughs> Played by uh, the incomparable Anne Ramsey. Oh my uh, gosh, she had, from uh, Throw Mama from the Train, Don't Throw Mama from the Train, and, and, uh, and uh, the Goonies. Everybody remembers her from the Goonies. Oh my Mama gosh. Mama Fratelli, and who doesn't love her? I, I honestly, when the moment she came to the door, I was just like, Oh, cool. We're oh, yeah. get to see more of her. Yeah, I absolutely love her. Uh, she's got, you know, that that husky voice. She's not uh, a very uh, domineering figure just in stature, but when she talks, she's got this presence where, you know, she's she's a bitch and, and you don't want to you don't want to cross her. And so she's the mean old lady across the street. Um, right. And then it's uh, Halloween time, I think, and they're trick or treating. Well, no, I guess it establishes because her um, his friend Tom has a paper route. Yeah. And he tosses the paper over, and she immediately um, jumps out and takes offense to the fact that they're out in front of her door. Right, and waves their sh her shotgun, her double-barreled shotgun, at them from her porch, as, you know, suburbanites tend to do, and kids get up on their lawn or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah <laughs> chases but, them off. Yeah, chases them off. Uh, and, and from there, we kind of get into the trouble of the film. Uh, Sam comes over to Paul's house. Paul lives with his, his mother. The father's not in the picture, apparently. We don't hear much about him if anything yeah sam comes over for uh thanksgiving dinner i believe and when she goes home she finds her father awake and drunk waiting for her and things kind of go downhill from there that's right she goes upstairs he's angry that she was gone and he didn't know um i think what is it it's even thanksgiving day was yeah that right yeah uh, she just finished having thanksgiving with the her surrogate family right. you know next door he pushes her down the stairs and right. uh she uh, doesn't wake up from that. She basically yeah. is in a coma. Uh, brain dead, I, I guess, was the assumption. Yeah. Right. And here is uh, where the Frankenstein conceit comes in. Paul doesn't accept the doctor's suggestion that there's absolutely nothing that can be done. Um, being a neuroscientist and uh, engineer himself, he decides that uh, maybe there is something that he can do. So he enlists his friend Tom, who is a very unwilling participant, and they go to uh, the morgue where the plant, well, uh, they don't know yet that her life support has been turned off prematurely. Uh, at first, they think they're going to be able to get to her while she's still alive, but that's not the case. And so when that part of the plan is foiled, uh, instead what they decide to do is kind of casually steal her body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and we forgot an important point is that uh, during Halloween, before Sam died, there was an altercation where they were playing basketball. A basketball went across the street onto the porch of uh, Elvira. Yeah. She came out, they hid, and the robot, Paul, controls the robot with the device, like right. a remote control. He shuts the robot off because he doesn't want the robot involved. 
The robot sort of comes to life on its own and approaches Zelda with her shotgun. She destroys it. Right. right. And that is an important plot point. And, and it's a, a very dramatic, uh, if you want to call it that, maybe melodramatic would be more fair, a very uh, dramatic <laughs> scene where, you know, uh, the friend, Tom, is holding Paul back while... Uh, Phoebe gets, <laughs> gets yes, blown man. away. I think he gets shot three times from this shotgun. And she just casually reloads. <laughs> <laughs> starts shooting some more. Uh, and, and he's demolished. And and the reason that it's important, I'm glad you, you corrected me, is because uh, Paul's plan is to use the microchip from the remains of BB and put it into Sam's brain uh, and hopefully... Yeah, well, you know, he's the scientist. I don't know right. science, but but apparently, you know, that, that could work. So uh, <laughs> so they give it a go. And it works uh, to a certain extent. He brings him in. I know it was just hilarious. You know, well, you always have to suspend disbelief Absolutely, for a yeah. film. This film kind of pushed it to the edges as far as suspending disbelief, even for the 80s. Yeah, I you mean, know? <laughs> it, and, and the funny thing is, you know, I can't tell how much he, Craven was going for tongue-in-cheek. I, I have to think that he was sometimes, because there are laugh-out-loud funny parts in this movie. But then there are some parts where, you, you know, apparently the, the procedure for inserting a uh, microchip into somebody's brain is just to kind of squish it in. Like, <laughs> just push it, you know. He has these probes jutting out from it, and he just, you know, I guess it's just the right area yep. of the brain, and they're all the right length. They're just going <laughs> to attach to the right spots. Yeah, and it slides in, he says, well, like, perfect. <laughs> That's right. It's like, it's like putting a spark plug in your car or something. Yeah. And just slide it in and snap it in place. Uh, and it, it, it works, you know. It, it does, she doesn't uh, spring right to life. She's not the Sam that, that we knew before. But she does uh, show some movement, and so uh, they uh, pack her back up in the van in broad daylight. By it's, it seemed, wasn't it? Yeah. Like, it was very bright outdoors, I don't know, but then they... There are really you know, very few people in this town. Right, <laughs> yeah, it's a very sleepy cul-de-sac. Um, right. and, and they put her uh, in the shed until they can figure out uh, what uh, to do with her. But apparently, as, as a little bit of time goes by, the chip does its work, and uh, she starts to reanimate, and then she becomes a deadly friend. That's right, that's where the deadly part comes in. It's interesting because that's that whole sequence where he's starting to coax her to life mm -hmm. was when the movie started to get a little more interesting for me. That was where, for me anyway, it was a little more realistic. Like, oh, she didn't just spring to life. Yeah. He had to sort of teach her to sit up. And, you know, her eyes were open, but she didn't say anything. Uh, you could kind of tell that the old robot was kind of worrying right. in there. It was definitely not her. She was definitely not recognizing him as his friend. Yeah. And, you know, that was, it's funny that you say that that's kind of where it took a turn for the better for you, because for me, up until that point, I had thought it had kind of an innocent, kind of sweet charm. You know, you had this cute little budding romance between Sam and Paul. The the tone, you know, there there was a, a dark side to it with the abuse with Sam's father and, and whatnot, but, you know, she had kind of found this new surrogate family. She was uh, budding this relationship with this new guy, and it was kind of sweet. And then all of a sudden, she dies, tragically, and uh, he tries to bring her back. And, and the, all the time going on in my mind was, it's not her. He keeps, <laughs> he keeps talking to... He, he keeps calling her Sam, but even he said from the beginning he was putting BB's brain in her brain. Yeah. And when she with comes some back... With some modifications. So when she does wake up, she's got this great robot uh, move thing going on. Yeah, um, she really does the good job with the physicality of BB. I read that she actually studied movement. You know, that was something that they, they really wanted to get down. Now, I, when I read that, I was expecting, you know, some masterful performance here. <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly what we got. No. Uh, you know, it, it looked a little bit like, you know, me on the dance floor after a few too many trying to do the robot uh, sometimes. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it, she, she made the effort, uh, and, and that was good. And, and there was clearly a distinction between her sweet character from the beginning uh, and then after she passed away and, and uh, the robot mind kind of took over. That's true. Um, and, you know, and I guess I wasn't really saying that, uh, that the movie got interesting. I mean, well, I, I guess what I was saying was I agree with you that it started out real sweet. It had that really nice tone. It definitely, the tone shifted. Yeah. And got really ridiculous, I think. And then at that point where, you know, he was kind of teaching her to move and, to, and all that, that suddenly, for me, anyway, oh, maybe we're getting, things are slowing down again, you know, was mm -hmm. kind of how it felt for me. 
there's a lot of weird holes in this plot. Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, it, the, well, aside from the fact that it doesn't make a lot of sense, even when you sort of just suspend your disbelief and say, okay, yes, genius kid, okay, he can plug this brain in here, whatever. There's also sort of a lack of care and concern from the adults around that... Mm-hmm. I'm thinking particularly the sequence where the mother and uh, Tom and uh, Paul has his friend over, um, and it's before they're going to pull the plug on the girl, mm-hmm. and they know that this is going to happen at nine o'clock or ten o'clock at least, and they're not there at the hospital. You look tired. Maybe you should just go to bed. Oh, wide awake. Yes. I keep thinking about the hospital. Thinking we should be there. What could we do? Just sit. Well, I know, but it just feels so strange. Of course, they've drugged the mother to yeah. go to sleep so that they can actually get to the hospital. But and there's an odd um, scene before that where they're having dinner and he's trying to poison her. Yeah, her cup. I, he roofies his mom, which is kind of. You know, I guess, you know, as far as plot devices go, okay, I, I get that. You know, need to get her out of the way. But why did he have a big old thing of roofies anyway? <laughs> like, <right? laughs> Who is this kid? Uh, I don't know. He's also a chemist. Come okay, on. okay. Wait, all right, fair uh, enough. By now. Yeah. But that whole scene was, it was a very uh, awkward scene. But it was awkward for the wrong reasons, you know? Yeah. It wasn't awkward because here this family and this friend are coping with the loss of their friend next door. That almost seems like everybody's forgotten about that now. Yeah, it's and it, it just kind of, I just felt like tonally it was all over the place. Mm. It, it didn't know what it wanted to be and I'm sure a lot of that had to do with the fact that much of it was redone in post production. Like you said, when it uh, was screened for test audiences, they didn't care for it. The studio execs didn't like it. They didn't think it was going to make money. Uh, And so there was one uh, exec in particular who really pushed for a lot of changes. They ended up doing a lot of reshoots. There was never intended to be any kind of significant gore. Anything with any kind of gore is cut and and pasted in. The death scenes were far more tame. Uh, Elvira's death scene in the in the final cut is is really graphic, oh comical, gosh. hilarious. It is. <laughs> it's a hilarious moment. Uh, I don't even know if we should spoil. It's so good. Like, that, it's worth waiting for. That has to go down in history as one of the most notorious death scenes in any film. It, I mean, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 so good. It's it's so bad. It's good. Is is. Uh... It's that kind of thing. But I, I loved it. I mean, that got me back on board after uh, some kind of questionable things. But so, yeah, I, I, I can tell. I almost wish that we had a director's cut. I'd almost like to see the what, yeah, what he intended it to be. Because I have a feeling it, it could have been a cute kind of sweet uh, movie for younger people. And that's what he was going for. And then these, you know, the every dream sequence that's in the film, and I think there are two or three, those were added after post-production. They were trying to capitalize on the success of Nightmare. So they wanted, you know, things that were familiar uh, to Craven fans. There's even, I would, I would go so far as to call it a Freddy cameo. Uh, oh yeah. In the, in the... Well, what has happened, I guess once she wakes up, uh, and, uh, he's kind of keeping her in the shed. There's a really, for me, there's a very interesting moment when she sort of snaps to the next level of brain function, Mm -hmm. where she is staring out the window and approaching it, the window of the shed, which looks out on the back porch of her house, as though suddenly she is recognizing it's it's that robot brain melding with her human brain for the first time, the back porch of the house, and her dad opens the door. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right on cue. And uh, sort of like clockwork, you can suddenly see in her eyes, she's looking and staring at him, and she turns her head, and she looks, and she stares at Paul, and she looks back at the dad, and he's like, okay, now we're going to seat you back down here, and we're going to close you up. But she gets out, and she goes over to uh, her dad's house. She sneaks out um, as the robot or whatever, goes back to her old house, confronts her father in the basement. Again, Another Cravenism coming yeah, back, right? You got the the big, uh, in this case, it's coal burning. You got the big furnace in, in the basement. Uh, every, <laughs> everyone we've watched so far has had a furnace in the basement, and it's been a pivotal plot point. And I they're not know. modern furnaces at all. Right, no. They're this one is like big... a coal furnace with a, a huge coal bin. That... Fires coming oh out gosh. of it. Mm-hmm. And the outside of it is, is hot. Right. <laughs> 
And he lure, she lures him down there almost, and that was a comical for me, almost like uh, when she puts a little put thing of bourbon on the yeah, steps. she baits him. He's on. like a mouse reaching for some cheese, and she grabs him and yanks him down the steps. And basically grabs him, burns him to death, right? Yeah, she burns, she, well, she breaks his neck first. Uh, she holds him up against the burning furnace, and his, you hear his neck snap, and his head uh, falls back. Um, and then it cuts back to uh, Paul, who is still searching the neighborhood for her. He sees smoke coming out of the house from the furnace. He goes down and finds her there and she has put the dad in the furnace. When Paul uh, pulls the dad out of the furnace, um, his entire upper body, including his face, is severely, severely burned. And then later on, just you know, a few scenes later, Paul has a nightmare sequence, which of course at first you don't realize is a nightmare. But, but like a form coming underneath his sheets towards him. Right. Uh, and when he pulls the covers back, it's revealed that it is uh, the burned father reanimated. Of course, this is all a dream. And he rises up out of the bed in all, in exactly the same way that Freddy rises <laughs> up out of the bed. It in really is. And in New Nightmare. You could have put uh, Johnny Depp in there. You could have. Oh, thrown, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, it, you know, it, with the severely burned face and the dark clothes, I mean, it, it, it almost was a Freddy Krueger cameo. Um, so, so you could see that Craven was kind of going out of his way to do what the studio exec said. You know, I, I don't know how much say he had in that. And I've read that um, in interviews when he's talked about this, he's talked about uh, some of the problems um, that they faced with, with all these studio expectations and whatnot. And he said that the final product... He doesn't know what to make of it. You yeah. know, it, it, uh, it is what it is. It's kind of a hodgepodge of different things going on. And, uh, and neither did the audience know what to make of yeah. it. Yeah. Really. I mean, it wants to be a horror movie. At times it gets really sweet. Actually, like you said, sort of for the first uh, half almost of the film, you have this sort of romantic kind of interesting thing. And then it does have these moments of real poignancy, you mm -hmm. know? I'm thinking about, uh, well, let's see, the father dies, uh, he then he hide, decides he needs to hide her um, in the bedroom uh, or whatever of her house. Mm -hmm. Elvira from across the street uh, sees her and calls the cops, and she ends up coming over and killing Elvira. Then he decides he needs to hide her up in his own attic. It's mm -hmm. the only place he can keep her. Uh, and then he finds her, she kind of breaks out of the attic, which leads right into his room, so yeah, it's right. probably the safest place for him to put her. And for the first time, she sees herself in the mirror. Yeah. And throughout all of this, I get, get what you're saying about tone, because people are dropping, you know, pretty quickly on, on the block, but nobody seems to be all particularly concerned about it. You know? And, and uh, they sort of stop looking for her corpse all of a sudden. Yeah, and, and you know, Paul it seems to be more concerned about just kind of keeping her protected than, he, more concerned than he is about the fact that she's killing people. Now, the people that she's killed have been very, not very nice people, Nonetheless, you've got this, you know, reanimated corpse who, you know, goes off uh, at any time. But, but you're right. They try to maintain that kind of sweet relationship between them. And it's suggested that her humanity is kind of slowly coming back. So, again, just tonally, it's, it's really uh, kind of bizarre. And, and it doesn't also make a lot of sense because... Here is this genius who's put, who's engineered this chip, installed it in her. You know, he's at first controlling her, turning her on and off like he turned his robot mm -hmm. on and off with a remote. And then it becomes pretty clear the remote's not working right. anymore. Why doesn't he just tinker around with her some more? <laughs> you know, instead of hiding her in the, he's got her in the house. He seems to be extremely successful uh, at keeping her hidden uh -huh. when when she needs to be hidden. Why not pull that chip out and do a little more reprogramming to kind of calm these um, homicidal tendencies. Well, I don't know what his plan was from the beginning. I mean, everybody knew this girl was dead. I don't know, you know, how he planned to reintroduce her if he ever did. You know, maybe I'm questioning too much. But, yeah, and, and you know, why didn't he do those things? He kept leaving her to go other places, but I never really got the sense that he was going anywhere important. Like, he was going no. to pick up his mom's dry cleaning. Like, <laughs> is that really that important? Like, maybe you could make time for that later. Well, Deal with the homicidal, you know, robot person in your attic first. I don't know. Well, and she's established uh, repeatedly that she's her strength, you know, allows her to open up doors and break down doors that have been broken into. He doesn't even care. More stuff that just doesn't even make any 
sense. And, and you know, as, as much as I am talking about these things, and it, it probably sounds like I'm being pretty critical, I have to say, I'm glad we watched it. I enjoyed it for what it was. It was funny, sometimes intentionally, not so, sometimes uh, not so much. But, you know, these little things that just didn't make any sense. Like, in the beginning of the movie, B.B. is voiced by, I don't know the actor's name, but you pointed him out. He was in um, oh, yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, uh, it's um... He voiced Roger Rabbit uh, in the Roger Rabbit Film. Charles Fleischer, right, and and he w- he played the doctor in um, Nightmare on Elm Street. Elm Street yeah. um, so he he voices uh, the robot in the beginning, and <sighs> many things don't make sense. First of all, the robot talks and sings incessantly, <laughs> but not in any kind of coherent language. Is you know these funny little strange sounds. What do you think? Ah! Uh-huh. 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 Yeah, but it will not shut up. No, it, it goes on and on, on all the it's time. It's like it a babbling stops. baby. Right. But, as you pointed out, apparently as much of a genius as Paul is, he couldn't teach the robot English. You know, it's just <laughs> it's just nonsense stuff. But then, when the robot brain gets put into Christy Swanson, she goes mute <laughs> for the next 20, 25, 30 minutes um, until the very end when she starts making the meat merp sounds too. And I, I had no idea what was going on at that point. Yeah, <clears> it's, <throat> uh, it's very off. There's, okay, so if you go back to that scene where she was, she sees herself and she's sitting on the bed mm-hmm. uh, and he comes in and he sees her and she has tears in her eyes. Mm-hmm. What the hell's wrong with you? Don't you ever listen? What are you doing down here? Sam. She looks at him and is sort of holding up a picture of the three of them, the robot, her, and and the boy together like she understands. He looks at her and you're thinking, oh, this is going to be a pretty powerful little moment. Yeah. Paul, telephone. I'll be down in a minute. It sounds important. It's Tom. I'm coming. Don't you move. And he gets up and he leaves the room again. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it was like a moment that was supposed to happen. She's even sort of approaching him. You almost wonder if she's going to kiss mm-hmm. him. And he pushes her away way too quickly. Mm-hmm. There seems to be nothing going on in this kid's head emotionally. Right. You know, other than, well, I got to deal with this now. I got to deal with this now. Oh, I need to lock you up now. Oh, I need to find a way to hide this or whatever. Yet, on the other end, they're sort of trying to establish this progression of character with the girl and the robot. Right, and and I, you know, to Swanson's credit, I think that she does a good job. I mean, you can you can definitely see in her face when BB is is in charge of the ship, and when a little bit of her humanity is starting to come back. You know, when uh, when BB is is in charge, especially when you know she's on a. a a rage. She's very wide-eyed, and and her uh, movements are, are far more sharp uh, uh, and more robotic. When the more human side starts to come through, she softens. Her face softens. Her movements soften. Her eyes. Uh, yeah, her eyes soften, and uh, you. I mean, you get a sense that you see some of that humanity coming through, and you have to wonder in the original. You know, were they going to get a happily ever after? You know, what was scenes? her? Yeah, uh, was her humanity going to come back, and and maybe they could somehow have some sort of existence? I don't know. Or was she at least going to get something to play against? You yeah. know, <laughs> like somebody who would respond to yeah. her emotionally, so that we could see that. You know, and and there was none of that. Yeah, it was way more focused on the horror aspect, the kind of the hunt and the chase, and the oh, she's killed somebody. Now we got to go find her. Now the police are after her and mm-hmm. things like that. I think she takes off running, and he's chasing her through the streets at night. And the police are also, you know, on per- in pursuit because... Two deaths on one street. Right. All of a sudden, they discover the father's body about the same time they, they discover mm-hmm. Elvira's body. And then there's that just that weird, again, one of these strange things that just shows how disjointed this film is, where he's running after her... Or, ends up on this sort of empty street, and Carl, the biker from the beginning of the movie, who we only saw once, who we suddenly see again, happens to come in and decide he wants to start harassing him again. Oh, no, you don't. I waited a long time for this. Where's your little friend now, huh, shit fake? Huh? (laughs) Where's little BB now? He's not here, is he? He's all blown up. (laughs) Which is just an excuse 
for the girl to pop in right. and for her to murder Carl. Right. It seems like something that if, you know, more effort had been put in uh, from the get-go, if they had had a clearer vision of where they were going, this would have been something that would have got left on the cutting room floor. Yeah. It, it, it just seems very much cut and paste in. But, you know, mm-hmm. from a horror movie perspective, she has run out of bodies, people to kill. Yeah. <laughs> because she has already nailed every single person that as a robot or as a human, you know, was bad. And so the movie's got to kind of wrap up at this point, you know? <laughs> mm. Well, and, and she's also kind of started to turn on the good guys, too. There's a scene uh, where the friend, Tom, has finally had enough, which, you know, finally somebody has some sense in this movie, and he's had <laughs> enough, and he's going to tell the police, Robot Sam, as Tom is, is leaving the yard, Robot Sam throws herself out the window and attacks him, and it appears that she's uh, trying to kill him, too. Uh, I know that this was another scene that was completely put in. I don't think originally she was supposed to ever turn against her friends turn against the good people of the movie so it doesn't know you know it doesn't know what it wants to be and and it leaves me at the end not really knowing what I want you know I I don't know what I want to happen at the end the end um, there's you know this long kind of police chase through town Uh, Sam's on foot running Um, she can jump over cars and pick people up and throw them 30 feet you know holding them over her head again why does she have superhuman strength? I guess microchips do that. I, yeah. I don't know. But then eventually uh, the cops corner them and Sam uh, is, you know, going back and forth between her robot vision and like human vision. Uh, and you see the humanity coming out and she starts to run towards Paul, who is being held back by the police. And the police think she's being aggressive and uh, they shoot her. In another thing, in another spot that's supposed to be kind of a moment, I mm-hmm. think, because now she's sort of at stage four of awareness, right? Now you, you get the POV shots of, of her robot vision flickering with her human vision. And you're almost starting to think, oh, may, and, she, and she says for the first time Paul's name, uh-huh. right? like you said. In her own voice, right? In her own voice. And so you're getting to this point where, oh, maybe the human part of her is starting to take control. Um, and maybe there is a turnaround now, a turnaround point. And, of mm-hmm. course, as a tragedy, then, she runs up into the police, the robot. I think she's threatened by the guns. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The robot part kind of, like, sees the threat. She runs up to the police, and the police shoot her, which is, I guess, once you got a, you know, you can fall down the stairs, you can be brain dead for hours and have a microchip planted in you, you know, no need for shocking your heart to right. life or anything like that. But once you've taken a bullet to the stomach... That is the end all be all. Yeah, uh, and and I, I I read I think that you know the ending was supposed to be different. Um, I don't know if she was supposed to get shot or something along those lines was supposed to happen. Um, but I, I do know that there was a, a scene filmed where they had a, a discussion about what they were going to do in the future, and he was saying we have to go away, I have to hide you, and it kind of ended on an ambiguous note. You really didn't know what happened. Oh, um, instead. We get probably one of the lamest end caps uh, from oh a film I've ever gosh. seen. Oh my gosh, boys, was that bad? And again, this was the studio exec. Uh, I, I've read, you know, what the film, what Craven and the other filmmakers have said, and, and they said, you know, this the exec handed this down. He came up with the concept. Uh, he wanted it filmed a particular way, and they just kind of threw up their hands and and went with it. And he is uh, a moron. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 awful, folks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think the the film would have been better if they had just cut off those last few minutes. Oh yeah, <clears throat> you could have ended it with one of those pull away shots going up into the clouds of him embracing her body right. finally. It'd be kind of a bittersweet ending. It, it would be kind of a Frankenstein ending, you know? Yeah. Oh, the master kind of embraces his monster, and the monster's gone, and all that. And, uh, but instead, we get that tacked-on ending where she's in the morgue, mm-hmm. and he goes back. Why Why did he even go back to the morgue? <laughs> Pulling her body out again, like, I'm going to try it another time. And um, suddenly, she wakes up, comes to life, and starts strangling him, which, A, makes no sense. Right. And then the face starts to peel away. The arms start to peel away, and it turns out that she's mechanical inside. Yeah, she has somehow morphed into some sort of evil-looking version of what BB was in the beginning. Yeah, it's like a it's like a David Cronenberg's Transformers. You yeah, know, kind it's, of thing. it's 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 bizarre. <laughs> it's bizarre. It's not you know the the effects aren't even good. I mean, it looks like they put like a pinata head underneath some cellophane and you know just ripped the cellophane. Oh yeah, and then when she <clears> pops <throat> out, you can tell it's a mask on her face. Yeah, oh, it's, just it's horrible. It's bad. <laughs> so, what would you say is your overall assessment? 
Gosh, man. I would love to have seen the original movie. Mm-hmm. I would love to have seen the poignant type, type of movie that he wanted to make. And maybe that the, with the novel that it was based on is yeah. more like. But at the end of the day, I just didn't care. You yeah. Know? It's like you said, it was, it was tough to get emotionally invested because it was all over the place. I didn't know what I wanted. And so I, I, I was just watching. And don't get me wrong, it like kind of like you said too, I was entertained. It wasn't horrible. I wasn't compelled to get up and flip mm. it off immediately. But I knew there was going to be no payoff before yeah. I saw no payoff. Right. You know, and so I was just kind of more curious, sort of as a historical artifact. Yeah. You know how this would kind of wrap up. And and I, you know, the the first forty five minutes probably, I, I would never have said that it came anywhere close to being a masterpiece of a film or even as good as some of Craven's own better films. Um, but it had a kind of charm to it uh, initially. You know, it was a bright, sunny neighborhood, and and the score, you know, early on was kind of cheerful. Um, it had almost an after school special kind of vibe to it. Um, uh, it reminded me kind of a little bit of the boy who could fly. You know, there was you know kind of some wonder and mystery, but it was cute and fun and innocent. And then I think that it was always expected to take a darker turn, but I think that when they pushed that farther than they had originally intended, it just kind of lost me. Uh, so, you know, I, I wanted to like it, and there are definitely things that uh, I was entertained by. It was it was funny uh, in parts. Christy Swanson gives a good performance, oh, I think. Yeah. All, you know, it's nice to see kids playing kids. Yeah, yeah right? absolutely. Back in the day when they'd have 16-year-olds playing 16-year-olds right. instead of people who are obviously like 25, yeah. you know? Uh, uh, for me, the the movie is worth seeing for Anne Ramsey alone, and she probably get maybe <laughs> maybe five minutes of screen time, maybe. Um, but just I could just about watch her in anything, um, and then her death scene, just for the sheer oh ridiculous gosh, nature guys. of it, uh, it's worth the price of admission right there. You know, I bet it's up on YouTube somewhere. Oh, I'm you, sure it is. You could probably Google it, find it on YouTube, and just watch that. <laughs> Um, don't let your kids watch it. Right. <laughs> but nothing is more absurd than that scene. Yeah. I mean... Go ahead. Th- no, I'm thinking of all the death scenes and all the movies I've seen. I don't know if, how, much, how many actually top that. Oh, gosh. No, it's great. So, you know, horror enthusiasts out there, especially if you're a fan of Craven, I would say it's worth the hour and a half to give it a go. I don't know that it's necessarily anything that I'll ever want to watch again, but... We'll see, you know, if it's on at 2 in the morning on a Saturday night sometime. Uh, who knows? Well, and if you're interested in catching those Cravenisms, yeah. right? The, the the suburban happy kids, the overbearing parents. Terrible who parents who again. Terrible, and then, of course, you know, the turn for the dark um, and, and sort of taking care of him. Craig, uh, thanks for sitting and watching another one of these films. Hey, my pleasure, as always. Hopefully next week we'll uh, tune in with something that we'll enjoy a little more. Yeah, <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, until then, if you enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends, uh, like our Facebook page, and uh, check us out next week. This has been Todd and Craig and Two Guys and a Chainsaw. <laughs>